L an announcement for an extra credit opportunity if you want to take advantage of that. It's like the previous one. Um, MTSU uh, Department of Speech and Theater and Nashville Shakespeare Festival are going to be doing a production of Midsummer Night's Dream uh, November 9th to the 12th, 7.30 in the evenings, I think the 9th and 10th or 10th and 11th, something like that. They're going to have 10 a.m. Uh, matinee programs. Um, read what I said and do it if you want the extra credit. And make sure you turn it in on time, which for this class, I think I said uh, the, the deadline is the 16th, but I'm not positive. I think it is, but I'm not positive. Um, and also remember, you've got coming up not much later than that, I believe, a deadline for submitting a paper topic okay, to me, and then about a week after that, or maybe two weeks after, after that at most, the papers do. So semester is um, winding down, actually. Okay, so let's pick up with where we left off last time. It's in that chapter, The Hungarian Hornet, which is, I believe, chapter 19. And I think we left off with Harry, Ron, and Hermione at the three broomsticks. Harry's wearing his invisibility cloak, not because he's in trouble or anything. He just doesn't want to be noticed by people. Because every time somebody sees him, they press their little Cedric Dibbery button, which then reads Potter Stinks, and he's getting kind of tired of it. And while there, on page 322, we learn something, and I think we talked about this last week, but I just want to make sure. We learn that Moody can see through invisibility cloaks, which seems to be a problem when the invisibility cloak is brought up in book seven. Or maybe it's not a problem. Maybe the answer is that the invisibility cloak referred to in book seven is not like other invisibility cloaks. Not quite clear because they're just supposed to be rare, etc. Anyways, that's the only point I wanted to bring up um, there. Oh, while there, Hagrid tells Harry to meet him down at his cabin at midnight. Harry's like, okay, that's weird, but okay. So he puts on his cloak, and he goes and meets Hagrid in his cabin at midnight. He's also supposed to meet whom that night? Sirius. Okay. He's supposed to meet Sirius in the common room. He doesn't know how he's supposed to meet Sirius in the common room, but he's supposed to um, essentially meet him there. So here he goes off with Hagrid, and Hagrid has his cloak on so nobody else can see him. And what is Hagrid doing? Going for an evening stroll with Madame Maxime, you know. Who else do they see? Igor Karkaroff, okay. So Harry comes to understand they've got to get past dragons for their first task. And he assumes what? Okay, Harry knows, obviously. Madame Maxine knows, so who else is going to know? Fleur. Karkaroff knows, so who else is going to know? Crumb. Who doesn't know? Cedric doesn't know. Okay. So he then goes back. And he meets Sirius. Sirius tells him about some strange goings on. Talks about Bertha Jorkins missing and such. And just says, you know, kind of keep your nose to the ground and don't do anything you shouldn't do. The next morning, the morning of the Triwizard test, the first one, Harry stops Diggory in the hallway. He doesn't actually stop him. He does a spell on his book bag and makes it rip open, and then he goes and pretends to help him. At page 341, excuse me, bottom of 340, Harry says, Cedric, the first task is dragons. What? Cedric says, dragons. They've got four, one for each of us. We've got to get past them. Are you sure? Dead sure. I've seen them. How did you find out? We're not supposed to know. Doesn't matter. I'm not the only one who knows. Fleur and Crumb will know by now. Maxime and Karkaroff both saw the dragons too. Cedric straightens up. Why are you telling me? Does that tell us anything about Cedric? 
If the situation was turned, would Cedric tell Harry? The question seems to imply that he wouldn't. Okay. Harry looked at him in disbelief. He was sure Cedric would have asked that if he had seen the dragons himself. Notice, we are told from Harry's perspective, Harry is assuming Cedric doesn't really mean that. That if Cedric had seen the dragons, he would have told Harry too. What's Harry's response? Well, Harry goes on. The narrator goes on. Harry wouldn't have let his worst enemy face those monsters unprepared. Well, you know, maybe Malfoy or Snape, but it's just fair, isn't it? Okay, fairness is supposed to be one of the qualities of Hufflepuff, not Gryffindor. We all know now. We're, we're on an even footing. See? Right? Cedric kind of looking at him like he doesn't quite believe him. In Mad-Eye Mood, he sees Harry and says, Come with me, Potter. Diggory, off you go. So Harry goes off with Mad-Eye Moody. He goes to his office, which is now different than it was the last time he was in the office. Okay, This is the office Lupin had the year before, and Lockhart had the year before that, and Coral had the year before that. All the pictures of Lockhart are gone. And instead, what do we have? Dark magic, dark arts sensors and everything all over. I mean, it really goes to Moody's paranoia, if you want. And so he explains what some of them are. And he says to Harry, 343, so, found out about the dragons, have you? Harry's, how do I answer this? You know, I can't lie to a teacher. He has before, but, you know. Moody, it's all right. Cheating's a traditional part of the Triwizard Tournament. No, it has been. Harry, I didn't cheat. Notice he wants to defend kind of his, whatever it is, his honor. Sort of an accident that I found out. Moody, I wasn't accusing you, laddie. I've been telling Dumbledore from the start, he can be as high-minded as he likes, but you can bet what Karkaroff and Maxime will be. In other words, he's been telling Dumbledore what? Tell Harry how to win. Yeah. You know, help him. Okay. So, you got any ideas how you're going to get past their dragon? Nope. Well, I'm not going to tell you. Play to your strengths. And what does Harry think? He thinks like Frodo when Gandalf says you have to use much, you have to use such strength, wits, and heart as you have about you. He goes, I don't have any. Won't you take the ring? Use your strengths. Harry, I haven't got any. What is Harry thinking of in terms of strengths? Yeah, academic disciplines. You know, he's not real great at English and math and geometry and... Moody, excuse me, you got strengths if I say you've got them. What are you best at? And Harry's like, well, Quidditch, but you know, that has nothing to do with school. That's just fun. But how do you play Quidditch? You have to fly. That's right, you know, a damn good flyer from what I've heard. Yeah, but I'm not allowed a broom. I've only got my wand. Second bit of advice, get what you need. Golly gee, what has Flitwick been trying to teach them seemingly for weeks? The summoning charm. Okay, Nice little fits right into the plot device, you know. Harry's looking at him because he still doesn't get it. Come on, boy, put them together. It's not that difficult. Like even Ron would get this, you know. And he finally gets it. So next morning, excuse me, he then goes and talks to Hermione. This is the day before the first time. Talks to Hermione. She helps him all day long with the summoning charm. And he finally masters it. So we get the first task. They don't just have to get past the dragons. Right? What do they have to do? They have to steal an egg from a mother dragon. You know? What do you never do to mothers? Threaten their young of any kind, etc. So he's got to steal the egg. And, you know, we're not going to go over it. But Harry does. And Harry does very well. So well that Bagman cries out because he's kind of announcing the uh, task. He says, my God, look at that. He can fly. Crumb, are you watching this? All right. Now, I always find it, or not always, but since about, I don't know, 2005 or so, I find it interesting that Harry's got to get an egg because 
What's in the egg? The, next the clue for the next task, okay? And I don't know that Rowling got her idea from the egg from this, but I think she probably did. If you go to London and you visit the cabinet war rooms, which are the rooms beneath Whitehall, Whitehall is an area of London, which are the, the <coughs> basement-like rooms beneath Whitehall from which Winston Churchill ran the British World War II program, essentially. They are, they've been restored and left exactly as they were in about 1944. Okay? They had been left when the war ended, you know, they just locked the doors and left everything for like 40 years. So that when it was reopened in the 1980s by the government, everything was exactly as it had been left. Okay? Churchill even had a little bedroom in there, and there's a burnt out cigar, and you know, the whole nine yards. So they turned it into a big tourist attraction. It's a big historical you know, um, thing. Well, they then added to that, they added the Churchill War Museum. All stuff about Winston Churchill's life and such. And one of the things that you have in there is you have one of what are called the Enigma machines, which if you saw the, uh, what's the movie, Imitation Game? Yeah. Okay. If you saw that film, that's all about the development of the Enigma machine, which was used to decode Nazi codes. Okay. Once this was developed and they got it working and everything, what would happen is the German code would be put into the Enigma machine and it would spit out like a ticker tape, okay? What it meant, translated, so to speak, into English. That ticker tape was then put in something, not read by anybody, but Churchill. It was just cut off, put inside something, and taken to Churchill. The thing that was put inside, a golden egg, oddly enough. Like you said, I don't know that she got this from that, but I don't know how else she would come up with the idea of that um, because it's just kind of odd that she does. Okay, so how does Harry do in the first task? Pretty good. Pretty good, okay? What happens at the end of the first task? What happened prior to the first task when Harry's name came out of the goblet? Who left him? Ron. And at the end of the first task, Ron comes back, they make up, essentially, and, and what do we see? Ron's like, whoever put your name in, I figure was trying to kill him. Harry's like, well, gee, thanks, Ron. You know, nice to have you back as a friend. Okay? So we get Hermione's, the House Elf Liberation Front, which I normally spend some time on, but I'm not going to because it's just a waste of time. <laughs> um, and then the unexpected task. What is the unexpected task? The Yule Ball. Is it merely going to it? Is it the actual fact that they have to dance? I mean, Harry has to dance. He's one of the champions. The four champions have to dance. The first dance at the Yule Ball. That's an unexpected task for Harry. What else is it? Finding a date. 14 years old, gawky, nerdy. For Ron, but you would think Harry... Should Harry have a hard time finding a date? Wow. I mean, he's famous, right? And that pretty much gets it. But he doesn't, does he? Why doesn't he find a date? He waits. So he waits. What about Ron? <laughs> he's oblivious, okay? Who do we come to find out, Ron? I don't want to say wanted to invite but should have invited. How do we know Ron should have invited her? Because Hermione says, if you wanted me to go with you, you should have asked me. Before. Who asked her? What does Ron call Crumb after this? He either calls him the enemy or Vicky. And we find out in the next book, okay, Hermione and Victor are still corresponding, and Ron calls him Vicky. Oh, what have you heard from Vicky now? Okay. Whereas when Crumb first shows up at Hogwarts, what's Ron doing? 
Yeah, he's in, yeah, he's in factory. He's just about bowing down, you know, before him. He keeps his little keeps his little figurine of Victor Crumb in his pocket, which is you know really kind of creepy. Um, but anyways, so what's the upshot of the unexpected task and the Yule Ball? <coughs> okay, one Hermione comes down the stairs looking like what? Cinderella at the Prince's Ball, right? Drop dead gorgeous. She no longer has the bushy hair on a motorcycle all over the place here. What about these things? They're perfect now. They're not normal. They're perfect. Yeah. They're, they're not even as big as they were before Malfoy hits her with the dense audio. Okay. Nobody recognizes her. And it was when Ron does, that's when he goes ballistic. Who do Ron and Harry go with? The Patel twins. Okay. Parvati and Padme. Okay. Couple of probably Pakistani girls. How are they described looking? Gorgeous. Two best looking girls in the year. Okay, who does that include in the year? Hermione, Lavender, who's, we're not really told what Lavender looks like, but she pretty much makes out with anything that moves, you know, we're going to see in other books, right? Gorgeous, long black hair. One of them has gold, I think, braided in her hair. What do Ron and Harry do while they're with Parvati and Padme? Stupid, stupid, stupid. Okay? They sit there and they sit at the table while Parvati and Padme go, you want to dance? No. Okay, fine. And they go off and dance. What do Harry and Ron do? Okay, they sit there and sulk a little bit. Well... Ron's sulking more than Harry is because Hermione's, Ron's term, fraternizing with the enemy. He's also wearing that stupid dog. Isn't he? Okay, what's Ron wearing? This is the other. Dress robes. Dress robes. More years. emphasis, yeah, but there's more emphasis on the dress than the robes because yeah. they look like a woman's robes. Real high, frilly, lacy neck and everything. So that Malfoy, you know, picks on them. So they leave the ball and go outside. Okay. This is why this chapter is important. What happens outside <coughs> the Yule Ball? Louder? And they overhear Karkaroff and Snape a little bit. What else? So Harry and Ron are just kind of walking around going, what's going on over here? Hagrid and Madame Maxime, and what do we hear from that conversation? Hagrid admits he's half giant and assumes what? She's assumes she's giant. She's like, oh, how dare you? I just have big bones, you know, and walks off. How big of bones? Seven foot tall bones. Now she's no, like, she's taller than that. She's like nine foot. Isn't she? Dumbledore's head comes up to her chest. And Dumbledore's tall, described as tall. We're going to see how tall, we're going to see to some extent, how tall Hagrid is, okay? How tall is he? We're going to see a picture of Hagrid the year he gets accepted to Hogwarts. So he's 11, and he's about 7 to 8 feet tall then. Jesus Christ. So not quite, but, you know, so he still has another what? Six, seven, eight years of growing if giants' growth patterns are human growth patterns. So if he's seven or eight feet at eight year, at 11 years old, by the time he's 18 or so, 10, 11, 12 feet tall, remember how big his hands are? The size, about this, if you rounded this off, the size of a garbage can lid. Okay? I'm 5'10". My, my hand is one, two, three about 1 20th this size. So Hagrid is, you know, two or three times my height, maybe, in order to have the hands that size. Madame Maxime is even larger because she's not half giant. She's full giantess. We can, we'll find out later. Okay, what else do they hear or see? Here's Fleur and Roger Davies, you know, making out over in the bushes somewhere. Right? So, they then go back inside. I'm skipping a bunch because I want to make sure we get to 
the end. Um, go towards the end of the chapter, very end, page 431, and Cedric comes up to Harry. Says, um, Harry, yeah? Oh, you one for telling me about the dragons. You know that golden egg? Does yours wail when you open it? Yeah? Well, take a bath, okay? What? Take a bath. Take the egg with you. Mull things over in the hot water. It'll help you think. Trust me. I'll tell you what, use the prefect's bathroom, fourth door to the left of that statue of Boris the Bewildered on the fifth floor. Password to Pine Fresh. Come go. Want to say good night? And so he said, Request. Cho. Is this quite the same as dragons? We got to get past dragons? No. no. What? If Cedric was really making it even or making it equal, what would Cedric have said? He would have told them what the riddle says. Yeah. But he doesn't do that. All right? So it's at the end of the chapter, 432, Ron and Hermione are yelling at each other, and Hermione says, well, if you don't like it, you know what the solution is. Ron, oh yeah, what's that? Next time there's a ball, ask me before someone else does. Ron, well, that just completely missed the point. No. <laughs> Ron completely missed the point. Okay. So we get Rita Skeeter's scoop. And what is the scoop? They go to class the next day. Who is not teaching care of magical creatures? Hagrid's not. Dumbledore's giant mistake. And so we read Rita Skeeter's scoop, and we find out about all the bad things that has happened while Hagrid has been teaching care of magical creatures. You know, Malfoy almost got his arm ripped off, he says. My friend Vincent Crabb got a bad bite off a flobber worm, which in that little part, you know, they don't do anything. They, they don't hurt you at all, okay? We find out Hagrid's mother was a famed giantess, etc. And Hermione's wanting to figure out how, how she heard that, how she knew that stuff, how she got that information, all right? So, Harry, Ron, and Hermione... Go off to the three broomsticks again. And they see Rita Skeeter, page 450 and 451. And Harry sees her and says, trying to ruin someone else's life? She turns around, Harry, how lovely. Why don't you come and join? I wouldn't come near you with a 10-foot broomstick. Would you, why did you do that to Hagrid? She says, our readers have a right to the truth. Who cares if he's half giant? There's nothing wrong with him. Notice the whole pub goes quiet. They're interested. They want to see what's going to happen here. Okay? She pulls out her quick quill quotes. Quick quotes quill. And says, okay, you tell me about Hagrid. You give me an interview. Hermione, you horrible woman. You don't care, do you? Anything for a story. Anyone will do, won't they? Even Ludo Bagman. Sit down, you silly little girl. Don't talk about things you don't understand. I know things about Ludo Bagman that would make your hair curl. What things does she know about Ludo Bagman? Jump to the end. He was accused of being a Death Eater. What was the evidence against him? No, it's not that he took a bribe. He passed information on to Augustus Rookwood. Why? Because Rookwood was an old friend of his dad's. And Rookwood promised him a job at the Ministry of Magic. Where did work? Where did Rookwood work at the Ministry of Magic? In the Department of Mysteries. Okay. We see all this when we see the courtroom scene. Really? Is that the kind of stuff that would curl Hermione's hair? Is that really bad? What is all that called? What would that be called in a court? Circumstantial. It's not hard proof. Okay? Why is he not sent to Azkaban? Merely because he's a professional Quidditch player? That is part of it. I mean, you can't dismiss that part. Rowling is kind of showing, look what happens 
if you're a famous athlete, <laughs> you can get off for bad charges. But what else is it? It's he's an idiot. He's a moron. He didn't know what he was doing. Okay. So they leave, and Ron says, 451, she'll be after you next, Hermione. Hermione, let her try. Oh, I'm going to get her back from inside. So Hermione's already plotting against her. She doesn't know how she'll get back at Rita Skeeter. So they go back to Hogwarts, and they go down to Hagrid's cabin because he's not been showing up for class. And Dumbledore's already there. Harry mentions, page 453, that Skeeter cow. Sorry, Professor. Dumbledore. I've gone temporarily deaf and haven't any idea what you said, Harry. Why doesn't he come to Rita Skeeter's defense? Why doesn't he say, Ms. Skeeter, Harry? Okay, one, he doesn't respect her. What's another reason? Okay, that would be part of the first one. What's another reason? She's not one of his employees. Okay. But when Harry says Quirrell in the first book, Dumbledore doesn't correct him. He doesn't say Professor Quirrell, Harry. Why not? Because Quirrell had that you know, little problem of having Voldemort attached to the back of his head. Yet every time, books one through seven, when Harry says Snape, without Professor, in front of it, Dumbledore says, Professor Snape, Harry. He corrects him every time. Why? Respect. One, he's a teacher at the school, okay, which Quirrell was. Okay. I don't think he corrects Harry when Harry says once or twice, I think it is Trelawney. I don't think he says Professor Trelawney, Harry because there's not a lot of respect there. Remember in Prisoner of Azkaban, Harry said, I think, uh, here he does say professor, that she made a prediction. And Dumbledore goes, really? Then that will make her total of accurate predictions to two. I should give her a raise. We find out what the other prediction is, end of next book. So, Dumbledore is there trying to talk Hagrid and coming back to school, and he eventually leaves and says, I don't accept your resignation, okay? And I expect you back in the classroom. Harry, when Hagrid says, you're not half giant. When Dumbledore tells him, you know, you can't hold out for universal popularity, page 454. It says, not a week has passed since I became headmaster of this school, and I haven't had at least one owl complaining about the way I run it. What should I do? Barricade myself in my study? Refuse to talk to anybody? Yeah, you're not half giant, he says. Harry, look at who I've got for relatives. Dudley, Vernon, look at the Dursleys. Dumbledore, excellent point. Look at my own brother. Arrested for what? Strange charms on a goat, you know. So Dumbledore says, I expect you back Monday morning. He leaves, the rest are left there. And he shows him a picture of himself with his dad. Hagrid was a good seven or eight feet tall. This is the middle of 455. Judging by the apple tree beside him, his face was beardless, young, round, smooth, hardly older than 11. Taken just after I got under Hogwarts, Hagrid says. Dad was chuffed. Thought I might not be a wizard. See, cost me mom well anyway. Dumbledore was the one who stuck up for me after Dad went. Got me the gamekeeper job. Trust people, he does. Gives them second chances. Why? Because Dumbledore doesn't hold to the belief that Hagrid does that certain people are rotten to the core. Okay? That's what sets him apart from other heads. He'll accept anyone at Hogwarts as long as they got the talent. Those people can turn out even if their families weren't, well, all that respectable. Go back to the second book and what he says about the Malfoys. What does that mean? That means Draco Malfoy can turn out respectable. Jump to the end of book seven. He does. How do we know he does? The idiotic epilogue. 
Okay? I don't think she should have written it. But what do we see in the epilogue? There's Harry. I almost said Harry and Hermione. That would be weird. There's Harry and Ginny at the platform for um, the Hogwarts train. They're seeing their kids off. And there's Draco Malfoy. What does he do? He tips his hat to Harry. Sign of respect. In other words, they're not drinking buddies. But there is some mutual respect there. Right? And then she went and wrote, or allowed to have written, a damn cursed child. Horrible, horrible play script. Okay? So he goes on. Some don't understand that. There's some who'd always hold it against you. That is, there's some who would hold your family against you no matter what. Kind of like Hagrid in book two. Has Hagrid made the connection? Has Hagrid learned from, quote, unquote, the mistakes he made in book two? No, not yet. Because Hagrid's not that kind of a thinker. Okay? And he tells Harry at the end of that chapter, Harry, I want you to win. When I first reminded you, you reminded me of me a bit. Mom and Dad gone. You was feeling like you wouldn't fit into Hogwarts, remember? Not sure you were really up to it. Now look at you, Harry. You're school champion. The only problem there is that Cedric Diggory pretty boy, you know, over there too. You know what I'd love, Harry? I'd love you to win. I really would. Why? It'd show them all. You don't have to be pure blood to do it. Why is Harry not a pure blood? His father's a wizard. His mother's a witch. But her parents were muggles. So it's not, pure blood doesn't mean parents who have magic. Right? So he's what? 75% pure? Dad's all the way pure. I don't know how, how you evaluate Lily's blood. <laughs> this is, you know, whenever you get into this kind of mentality of talking about one's purity of race, this is why it always breaks down. This is why, you know, universities ought to allow racists to come talk. Nice, calm venue, people not shouting them down. Let them talk, let them say what they want. And then have somebody else just stand up and do what? Point by point. Refute everything. Just point it out for the utter nonsense that it is. Rather than, hey, hey, ho, oh, oh, white supremacists got it. Nonsense. Let them talk and defeat them in the free marketplace of ideas. Okay? So, Harry goes off, next chapter, and he takes his egg and goes up to the bathroom, and there's Moni Myrtle. Kind of weird. I know. She's, you know, uh, peeping Joan. I <laughs> don't know what you call her. Peeping Myrtle? Whatever. Okay? And so he takes the egg and he goes under the water and he hears page 463. Come seek us where our voices sound. We cannot sing above the ground. While you're searching, ponder this. We've taken what you'll sorely miss. An hour long you'll have to look and to recover what we took. But past an hour, the prospect's black. Too late, it's gone. It won't come back. Harry doesn't have a clue what it means. All it does mean, he finds out, he's got to get something that's underwater. Okay. We don't know what it is Harry's going to miss. But Harry takes the words literally. If you're not there and save whatever it is you're going to miss, in an hour, you'll never see him again. Okay. So he starts to make his way back to his room. He gets caught by Peeves and Snape and then Moody. Moody gets him out of the trouble with Snape. And Moody and Snape have an interesting little conversation while Harry's hidden there in his invisibility cloak. So notice, he gets to hear what? Kind of the private talk between two professors. You know, every now and then, students will hear one professor talk about another professor, or a teacher talk about a teacher. They shouldn't. Harry hears all this, okay? He's already heard a little bit, right? The amazing bouncing white ferret? Snape. Oh, yeah, another old friend of mine, Moody says there. Okay. 
Snake, top of 472. Dumbledore happens to trust me. I refuse to believe he gave you orders to search my office. Of course Dumbledore trusts you, Moody says. He's a trusting man, isn't he? Believes in chances. Me? I say there are spots they don't come off, Snape. Now, he's using the metaphor of a leopard doesn't change its spots. What other spots is he talking about? The dark mark burned on the arm. It's almost like he's going, show me your arm, Snape. All right? So, as I said, Moody rescues Harry. What does Harry lo uh, loan to Moody? The Marauder's Map. Why? Because on page 475, Harry tells him it's a map of Hogwarts, etc., and he says it's quite useful. And he tells Moody, page 475, um, Moody asks Potter, you, you didn't happen by any chance to see who broke into Snape's office, did you, on, on this map? And he said, yeah, I did. It was Mr. Crouch. Crouch, are you sure? Possibly. He's not here anymore. He looks over the map. Notice. Who's looking at the map right now? Mm -hmm. Moody. <laughs> Harry's not. Okay. He's given, Harry's given him, um, Moody has the map. Okay. What can he see on it? it yeah, it doesn't say Alistair Moody in this location. Should it say Alistair Moody in another location? So that when Harry saw that it read Barty Crouch in Snape's office, what should he have seen? I never thought of it until just now. What should he have seen in the Defense Against the Dark Arts office? Moody. Because where is he? He's in the trunk. Okay, now the trunk has several levels. levels. So maybe there's something with the map that the trunk conceals. I don't know, but maybe. Anyways, we go on to the second task, right? And Snape, uh, excuse me, Sirius wants to see them. So, let me pick it up here. Dobby helps Harry, steals the gillyweed, and Harry goes off. And he finds the uh, captives, I don't know what you want to call them. And let's come to the end of the task. 507. So who got to the captives first? Harry, Harry did. And what did he do? Tried to save them all. Notice he kind of helped Crumb with Hermione. Notice the thing Crumb's going to miss the most, Hermione. Okay. Um, he stays with Ron, and what about Fleur and her little sister, Gabrielle? Well, she's toast, man, because Fleur is no good. <laughs> so, he doesn't leave until he can bring Gabrielle and Ron up, way after the hour time. So, pages 506, 507, we get the story. Fleur Delacour, excellent use of the bubblehead charm, attacked by Grindy Lowe's, Failed to retrieve her hostage, but she still gets 25 points. In other words, she gets a 50. Okay. <coughs> Notice the little educational mojo here about, you know, always say something positive. Good bubblehead charm, even though your sister died. Because <laughs> that's essentially what's happening. Fleur, I deserve zero. Well, at least she's honest. Cedric Diggory also used the bubblehead charm. He was the first to return with this hostage. But he came outside the hour limit, so he gets 47 points. Harry's thinking, man, if he was outside the hour, so I was way outside. Victor Crumb also came outside the time limit. He gets 40 points. And then Bagman says, Harry Potter used Gillyweed to great effect. He returned last, well outside the time limit of an hour. However, the Merchieftainess informs us that Mr. Potter was first to reach the hostages. 
in that the delay in his return was due to his determination to return all hostages to safety, not merely his own. Ron and Harry look, Ron and Hermione look at Harry like, you moron. Most of the judges feel that this shows moral fiber and merits full remarks. What does most of the judges mean? Who are the judges? Dumbledore, Karkaroff, Maxine, Bagman, and Barty Crouch. But Barty Crouch isn't there. He's missing. Okay. So Harry gets 45 points. Ron says, there you go, Harry. You weren't being thick. You showed moral fiber. What's moral fiber? It's the same thing Harry hears about with his first lesson with Moody. His character. He showed good character. Now, he did also show stupidity. <laughs> because what did the riddle say? The riddle said, if you don't bring them back within an hour, they're lost forever. What were they told at the beginning of the Triwizard Tournament? No one dies. In the past, people did. This time, we're not going to let anyone die. Okay? So, they go off to Hogsmeade and meet with Sirius. But before they do, Rita Skeeter publishes another article. Harry Potter's Secret Heart. Page 511. About his love for Hermione. Page 512. Miss Granger, a plain but ambitious girl, seems to have a taste for famous wizards that Harry alone cannot satisfy. Since the arrival at Hogwarts of Victor Crumb, Miss Granger has been toying with both boys' affections. Crumb, who is openly smitten with the devious Miss Granger. What did Ron say? Yeah, be careful. She's going to come after you next. And she's called a scarlet woman, etc. So, what does Hermione start receiving after this article? What kind of hate mail? Like serial murderer hate mail. I mean, she gets the letters with individual letters cut out from the Daily Prophet saying, you are a wicked girl, you know. Right? So, Snape threatens Harry, page 517, with Verita Serum. Verita Serum. What is that? Veritas. Truth. Serum. Serum. Sodium pentothal, in other words. It says, you know, Harry, just three drops and you would be spilling the beans. Well, there's a lot of beans Harry doesn't want spilled. Right? Karkaroff comes in, says, look, it's getting clearer. So they go off to Hogsmeade and meet with Sirius. And Hermione immediately launches on about Winky. And Ron's like, oh, please, give it a break. Page 525. All right? Hermione says, he just sacked her just because she hadn't stayed in her tent and let herself get trampled. Ron, Hermione, give it a rest. Sirius, she's got the measure of crouch better than you have. You want to know what a man's like? Take a good look at how he treats his inferiors, not his equals. Okay, so let's use that and apply it to a couple of people. What is Lupin like? How does he treat his inferiors? As equals. How does he treat Harry? Harry is his inferior. You know, teacher-student. It's a hierarchy, hierarchical relationship. Superior to inferior. Okay? Not worth value kind of a thing. He treats him as an equal, though. Okay? Mr. Weasley. Man, you guys wouldn't understand. You're too young, he says. Okay? Dumbledore. Harry. How does Harry treat Dobby? Would you like to take a seat on my bed? Dobby. Ah, I've never been asked to sit by a wizard before. You know, he goes all crazy. Draco Malfoy, to his inferiors. Oh, you're clearly a Weasley. Flaming red hair and more children than they can afford. Okay. So we get a variety of instances where we can, if we use Sirius's comment, we can use that to evaluate people. Sirius Black. 
How does he treat his inferiors? Or what he deems his inferiors, or what any of these people deem their inferiors. Does Harry think he has any inferiors? No. He doesn't even think Neville's inferior to him. Okay? Snape definitely thinks he has inferiors. How do you know? I don't see any difference in her teeth. They're down to here. <laughs> okay? Sirius, we're going to see how he treats his inferiors more in the next book than we do in this book. And it's how he treats Creature. But Creature is a different thing than Sirius. So even Dumbledore says, you know, it's not quite right, but yeah, I mean, how he treated Creature wasn't quite right. So, he goes on and talks about some of the absences and strange things going on. And the strangest is Crouch missing, not showing up for the Triwizard Tournament. He says it's not like Crouch. Harry, you know Crouch then? Oh, I know Crouch already. 526. He was the one who gave the order for me to be sent to Azkaban without a trial. Okay. Can somebody in the United States can, you know, well, I shouldn't ask that question because post 9-11, yeah, it does happen. I was going to say, can you be sent to prison without a trial? Yes, you can in the United States today. I mean, the feds can hold you for an awful long time. If you are a quote-unquote enemy combatant, you can be held indefinitely. And, and I don't have a problem with that. Why? Because they're not citizens. They're not our citizens. American citizens, however, are protected by this thing called the Constitution. The Constitution does not protect non-citizens. It only protects citizens, okay? But we do have, you know, various other things where we've had American citizens, you know, black opt, etc. Um, previous president used to, you know, just have them taken out with a drone, uh, American citizens who had turned against the country. Yeah? Traitors? The whole nine yards. The Constitu Constitution, however, still applies. So he goes on. Crouch was tipped for Minister of Magic. Instead of who do they have now? What's his last name? Current Minister of Magic. Why? You ever heard that word used as a verb? As in to fudge something? What does it mean? Oops. Yeah. That kind of describes fudge as the Minister of Magic. He's a screw-up. All right. Great wizard, Barty Crouch. Powerfully magical and power hungry. Notice, very powerful in terms of his innate ability. And what else? He wants more power. He says, no, Barty Crouch is always very outspoken against the dark side. But then a lot of people who, who are against the dark side, well, you wouldn't understand. You're too young. You're too young. Ron, that's what my dad said at the World Cup. Try us, why don't you? What is Ron saying? Okay, treat me like you're equal. Treat me like an adult. Treat me like I can handle the news. Serious. A grin flashes across his face. Why? Then you're going, okay, kid. You're up for it. I think it's partly that. I think there's something else. Yes. Sirius sees Harry, Ron, and Hermione. And what else does he see? James, Remus, and Sirius. Not, not the rat. Not the rat. Okay. The rat only got to where he was by them being nice to him. He says, okay, I'll try you. So imagine Voldemort's powerful. Notice he uses the name. He doesn't say imagine you know who's powerful. Okay. You don't know who his supporters are. You don't know who he's working for him and who isn't. You, don't, you know he can control people so that they do terrible things without being able to stop themselves. You're scared for yourself, your family, your friends. Every week, news comes of more deaths, more disappearances, more torturing. Ministry of Magic's in disarray. They don't know what to do. They're trying to keep everything hidden from the muggles. Meanwhile, muggles are dying too. Okay, now this comes out summer of 2000. <coughs> All right? 
What's he describing? Voldemort in power, and it's like the world is in chaos. Every week, new disappearances, new deaths, etc. So, leave this book for a moment and go to the beginning, for those of you who have read it, of Order of the Phoenix. Okay? This book ends with what? Voldemort's return, right? He has an actual body now. So, a month goes by, and the Order of the Phoenix begins. What is in Harry's mind? This. Voldemort's back. What should be happening? People should be dropping like flies. People should be disappearing. And instead, nothing. He's reading the front page of the newspaper, the back page of the newspaper. We'll talk about that when we get there. He's watching the news. Nothing. He doesn't understand. Okay? So, series goes on. Well, times like that bring out the best in some people and the worst in others. Crouch's principles might have been good in the beginning. I, I wouldn't know. He rose quickly through the ministry. He started ordering very harsh measures against Voldemort supporters. The Aurors were given new powers. Powers to kill. In other words, the unforgivable curses became forgivable. Right? And I wasn't the only one who was handed straight to the Dementors without trial. Crouch fought violence with violence and authorized the use of the unforgivable curses against suspects. I would say he became as ruthless and cruel as many on the dark side. He had his supporters, mind you. Plenty of people thought he was going about things about the right way. You guys are all relatively probably too young to remember right after 9-11. Because right after 9-11, 2001, right after 9-11, there was an awful lot of what going on in the United States. Okay, there was panic. But what else? No flights. Okay, for the first four days, no flights. Because I remember walking every day, and not a single contrail. It was like, this is amazing. Okay. But what else? We need to strike back. The fear among the media was, well, we got this Texan cowboy in the White House, and he's just going to go off half cocked. Did he? No. But there were people on the right, and remember, I'm far right, there were people on the right saying, once we find out who did this, if this was Iran, if this was Iraq, if this was Afghanistan, glass factory. Nuke all that sand. Just turn it into glass. Just bomb them back to the Stone Age. And there were, I mean, there were serious policy people essentially saying that. Let's don't Ask questions first, let's shoot first, and then ask questions. Okay? Why? Because we'd never been struck that way before. We had been hit before, not even a 10 years before. Okay? The first World Trade Center bombing, which most people forget about, right after Clinton was elected. I mean, February of 93, right after he'd become you know, president, they tried to bring down the World Trade Center. Didn't, thankfully. Okay? And then there were several things after that. The bombings in, in uh, Africa, Tanzania, the bombings in Saudi Arabia, Kobar Towers, the coal bombing in 2000, etc. There was just one thing after another. And we didn't do anything. Okay? So there's a lot of pent-up frustration and anger. And to see the two towers come down, which a lot of people remembered seeing the two towers go up in 1972 or so. Okay? That kind of struck it a chord. And then the Pentagon, you know, and knowing that probably the flight that went down in Pennsylvania was headed for either the White House or the Capitol. Can you imagine, just for a moment, if it had hit the Capitol, I mean, the dome, gone, like in all the, you know, tragic movies, etc. What do you think the United States public attitude would have been then? Torch, man, just... <laughs> Go all Rambo on them. Just, I mean, take whoever out. Okay? Whether we know it was them or not. Right? So, he says, I would say he became as ruthless and cruel as many on the others on the dark side. So, when Voldemort disappeared, it looked like only a matter of time until Crouch got the job. Why? Because his ways worked. Not that he had anything to do with Voldemort disappearing. 
until his son was arrested as being a deaf mute. That's no shock for Barty, top of 528. Should have spent a bit more time at home with his family, shouldn't he? Ought to have left the office once, early once in a while. Gotten to know his own son. Harry, was his son a Death Eater? No idea. <coughs> Serious, I was in Azkaban myself when he was brought in. Did Crouch try and get his son off, Hermione asks? I thought you had the read of the man, Sirius says. He wouldn't let his elf off, Hermione. Do you really think he's going to let his son off? No. You saw him dismiss a devoted house elf because she associated him with the dark mark again. Crouch's fatherly affection stretched just far to give his son a trial. Not much more than an excuse for Crouch to show how much he hated the boy, which we're going to see, right? Harry, he gave his own son to the Dementor? Well, not literally. He doesn't give them to the Dementors for a kiss. But yeah, they go off, goes off to Azkaban. And he says, you know, he came in screaming for his mother by nightfall, went quiet after a few days. They all went quiet in the end. Harry, you still in Azkaban? No, not in there anymore. He died about a year after they brought him in. When did they bring him in? After Voldemort's downfall. When was Sirius brought in? Who does the prophecy refer to in the third book? After 12 years, the servant, the chained servant will be unchained. He will return to his master. Is it Wormtail? No. Or is it Barty Crouch Jr.? Where's Barty Crouch Jr. been? For the last 12 years. Within his dad's house. How? Dad just has, you know, an ankle bracelet on him that doesn't let him go outside the house. He's been under an imperious curse. The prophecy, I believe, refers to Barty Crouch Jr. throwing off the imperious curse. And he will return to his master. And yet we assume that it's referring to Wormtail. Has Wormtail been chained for 12 years? He's been a rat. Okay? You could say he's chained into a rat, but, you know. But he's not chained. He, he could leave Ron, couldn't he? Easily. Because rats don't live for 12 years. Three, four, maybe five times, but not 12. Who had him before Ron? Percy. I don't know if there's that means anything or not, but it's just kind of find it interesting. So he tells Harry he died. Yeah, most go mad in there and they stop eating in there. So old Crouch lost it all just when he thought he had it made. Page 529, bottom of the page. Once the boy had died, people started feeling a bit more sympathetic toward the son. That is, word was published. Bartimius Crouch Jr., Died in Azkaban, the son. Uh, people started asking how a nice young lad from a good family had gone so badly astray. The conclusion was that his father never cared much for him. In other words, it was his father's fault. So Fudge got tapped. Right. So Harry, Ron, and Hermione, or Ron and Hermione actually go on and they start talking about Snake. Hermione's like, Dumbledore, trust Snake. Ron's like, yeah, but Dumbledore, you know, brilliant everything doesn't mean he can't be wrong. We're going to see a point in here where I think Dumbledore is clearly wrong. There's going to be a couple of points from here on out. And even Dumbledore is going to admit he can make mistakes, right? All right? So, Harry says, what do you think? What do you, could it be Snape? He says, I think they both got a point. Why? Ever since I found out Snape was teaching at Hogwarts, man, I had to wonder why, Dumbledore, why. When Snape, he says, began Hogwarts, he already knew more dark spells, hexes and such, than most of the seventh-year students who left. What else? All the people he hung out with, Death Eaters. And he mentions them. Rosier, Wilkes, killed by Orth the year before Voldemort fell. The Lestranges, they're a married couple. They're an Azkaban. Avery, from what I've heard, he wormed his way out of trouble by saying he'd been acting under the Imperial's curse, still at large. 
Poor Avery. He's going to get the imperious curse in this book. And then he gets it again in the next book. I'm pretty sure he gets it again in the sixth book. Okay? He just keeps screwing up. And uh, not the imperious curse, the Cruciatus curse. He just keeps getting tortured by Voldemort. Okay? So, Harry lets on that Mad Eye's been kind of sneaking into Snape's office and spying on him and such. And Snape, uh, Siri says, you know, it wouldn't surprise me when we get chapter 28, The Madness of Mr. Crouch. Hermione starts getting her death letters, if you want. And page 547, real briefly. The article about Hermione has had Hermione thinking. And she's starting to wonder, how could Rita Skeeter have known about Hagrid and Madame Maxine? How could Rita Skeeter, because of the article about her and Ron, uh, her and Harry and uh, Crumb come, came out, how could Rita Skeeter have known about my conversation with Victor at the edge of the lake when she wasn't there? So she's starting to think about this. On page 547, Hermione says, well, she's not using an invisibility cloak. I asked Moody. He said she wasn't there at the judge's table or by the lake. Ron, Hermione, is there no point telling you to drop this? In other words, this isn't important. Let's go on to other things. She says, no, I want to know how she heard me talking to Victor and how she found out about Hagrid's mom. Harry, maybe she had you bugged. What's Harry thinking? Our world. His normal world. Listening devices. Ron, what? You mean like put fleas on her or something? Notice how beautifully literal that works. Because what is a listening device? It's like a bug on you. Okay? And so Harry explains what it means. And Hermione's like, you guys, you're stupid, you know. Read Hogwarts of History and you know you can't use electronic devices and such. So they write to Percy, ask what's going on with Mr. Crouch. He says he's taking a well-deserved break. So they get ready for the third turn, the third task. Louis Bagman leads them down to the former Quidditch pitch, which now has this massive maze growing on it. He says, you've got to get through the maze. 551. That's right. Third task, really very straightforward. Triwizard Cup will be placed in the center of the maze. First champion to receive it, full marks. Fleur, that's all we got to do. We have to get through the maze. Well, there will be obstacles. Hagrid's providing a number of creatures. There will be spells that must be broken. You know, all that kind of stuff. And you'll go in according to how many points you have. Okay. So, Harry and Cedric, who are tied, will go in together. Then Crumb, then Fleur. Should be fun. So they get ready to leave, and Crumb wants to talk to Harry. He takes Harry off to the side. Where are they? When he takes them off to the side, they walk away from the others. They're at the edge of the Forbidden Forest. All right? Page 552. Crumb says, I don't want to be overheard. Harry's like, okay. I want to know. What is there be between you and Hermione? Hermione. Okay, great. Harry, uh, nothing. Hermione talks about you very often. We're friends. You have never, you have not. No, Harry thinks. You, you know. You fly very well. I was watching at the first task. Harry, thanks. That Warnsky fate thing, that was cool. And Harry sees something behind Crumb, and what does he do? Pulls him away. As he, you know, it's a forbidden forest. What could be in there? Blood-sucking Voldemort, you know, all kinds of things. And Crouch comes out. How does he look? How does, let me rephrase that. How does Crouch normally look? On a good day. On a regular day. Like at the, tri uh, at the Quidditch World Cup. Probably bow tie, strange, funny-looking 19th century suit. 
very fastidious, you know, trimmed mustache, horn rimmed glasses, you know. Now, beggar, like he's been wandering the streets, torn robes, bloody knees, mustache and hair, unkempt, etc. And he tells Harry, bottom of 554, top of 55, must see Dumbledore. I've done stupid thing with spittle dribbling out of his mouth and his eyes bulging and kind of rolling all around in his head. Who are you? Harry, student at the school. Not his. No, says Harry. Dumbledore's. That's right. Warren, Dumbledore. Harry, I'll, I'll go get him. Don't leave me, 556. I escaped. Must warn. Must tell. See, Dumbledore. My fault. All my fault. Bertha dead. All my fault. My son. My fault. Dumbledore. Harry Potter, Dark Lord, Stronger, Harry Potter. What should be going through Harry Potter's mind at this point? My fault, Warren, Dumbledore, Bertha Jorkins, dead. My son, Voldemort, Harry Potter, not a good mix of words. Any sentence that involves Voldemort and Harry Potter, now, not good. Especially considering what? How this book began. He wakes up having a dream about Lord Voldemort planning something about Harry Potter. So he says, no, no, you stay with Mr. Crumb. I'll go get Professor Dumbledore. Why does Harry go get Dumbledore and not Crumb? Louder. He knows where his office is. Crumb doesn't. What's the problem with Harry, however, going and getting Dumbledore from what we see? Who does he run into? Snape. And what does Snape do? Puts the brakes on. Well, maybe I don't want you to see Professor Dumbledore. He just acts like he is. Right? But Dumbledore comes out. Harry tells him a little bit of what he's heard. They go down, and what do they find? No Barty Crouch. Instead, they find Victor Crumb, who has been attacked. Karkaroff accuses Dumbledore in Hagrid's presence. And what does Hagrid do? Lifts him up against the tree. I mean, he's ready to bash his brains out. And Dumbledore has to go, no, Hagrid. No. Down, boy, heal. So we get chapter 29. What is the dream that Harry has? And notice where Harry has it. What class does he continually fall asleep? Divination. Others fall asleep in, in history and magic. Harry almost falls asleep in history and magic, but it's divination. Okay? There's a reason for this. I talk about it now and then I'll talk about it. Now I'll talk about it in the next book. Um, so, what's the dream? Let's skip a bit. Gets a letter from Sirius. Sirius, you know, jumps all over him. What are you doing, you know, going off the crumb like that? So, the dream. He's flying along the back of an owl. He sees a large old house. Windows broken. Recognizes the house. And there's Wormtail. And there's Voldemort. And there's Wormtail getting the Crucio curse. And Harry wakes up. So he goes to tell Dumbledore about his dream. He goes up and he stands outside the door and he hears voices inside Dumbledore's office. And the, dumb, the voices are arguing. 579 at the bottom. Dumbledore, I'm afraid I don't see the connection. Don't see it at all, says Cornelius Fudge. Ludo says Bertha's perfectly capable of getting herself lost. I agree we would have expected to have found her by now, but all the same, we've no evidence of foul play. How long has Bertha Jorkins been missing? This is like March. Since late August, at the earliest. Okay? That's like close to nine months. She's, she's been gone a long time. You know, when somebody's been missing a couple months, you really start to suspect foul play. In fact, it's not even quite that long. Right? 
And he says, and for her disappearance being linked with party crouches, I, you know, what's the evidence? Moody, well, what do you think happened to Barty Crouch? Two possibilities. One, he's gone crazy. He's finally gone crazy. Or else, well, well I'll reserve judgment. That is, I'm, I, I don't want to speculate. Why doesn't he? So, who does Fudge want to suggest possibly attacked Victor Crump? Where did this happen? Near the Bobatone's carriage. You know what she is, Dumbledore. I mean, she's a giant. Dumbledore says, I think she's a very fine headmistress. I no more suspect Madame Maxime than Hagrid. I think it's possible that it is you who are prejudiced, Cornelius. Moody, Potter kid's outside waiting for you. So they leave and Harry goes in. And Dumbledore leaves him alone in the room. And Harry's been in the office before. And it's, you know, it's got the nice big desk. And then all kinds of funny instruments around the walls. Take my, uh, if you're interested in Harry Potter again, take my Harry Potter course in London and we'll go to the studio tour um, location. The actual, not the crappy one you can see down in you know, Orlando and stuff. Um, and you see all the sets. Okay, so you go and walk into Dumbledore's office part way and see it. And you can see all the props and everything. Because the prop, I hate the films. Absolutely detest the films. But the Warner Brothers Studio Tour blows your socks off. It is amazing. The artwork, the props, and all that kind of stuff. And so he goes in. And the room's not well lit, but it is lit. And he sees in one shelf this kind of strange, eerie glow. Being a 14-year-old kid and there are no adults around, he's going to go check it out. So he goes and he sees it. Stone basin, runic carvings around the side. He has no idea what the runes mean. So he pulls out his wand and pokes the liquid, whatever it is. And he gets closer and closer to it. And what happens? As with Tom Riddle's diary... He goes into the pensive. Now, how is the pensive different than Tom Riddle's diary? Pensive shows thoughts and diary shows memories. Okay. What's the difference between thoughts and memories? What Tom Riddle's thing is called what? A diary. What do you do with a diary? Okay, you write down events or you write down your thoughts about those events of the day, etc. It's a way of collecting your memories and thoughts for the day. Kind of possibly, some people use journaling for this purpose, to make sense of your day. Okay, so what are you doing when you do that? You're filtering it through your own Bingo, you are filtering it. You are editing it. You're not writing down everything, right? Cognitive scientists tell us that what we see and what we hear, oddly enough, everything that we see and hear is stored. Everything. We can't access it. We don't know how to access it. Some people can access more, but if you're, they're doing a scientific study, okay, and part of your skull is removed, they can take really fine electrodes and touch certain parts of the brain, and guess what? Memories that you don't remember suddenly come front and center. And you can talk about things that happen to you that you have no recollection of. Why? Because you do have a recollection. You just don't know the key codes to get that recollection. Okay? Similarly, really scary, really spooky kind of thing. The thing was, a um, study was done just read about this about a month ago, about some guy who was in a quote-unquote permanent vegetative state for 18 years, no consciousness on a life, on life um, sustaining machines. And somebody came up with the bright idea, hey, let's attach some electrodes to him and see what happens. And they 
did the skull electrodes thing, measured his brain waves, and started asking him questions when he was in a still comatose state, right? And he would respond to the questions. They would ask, you know, blink your eyes if you can hear me. And he'd blink. Okay, this guy had been, quote unquote, vegetative for 18 years. What does that mean? Blink your eyes if you can hear me. Blink your eyes if 2 plus 2 equals 4. Blink your eyes if, and they did a whole series of these questions, showing that after 18 years of no consciousness, no, let me rephrase that, seeming consciousness, the consciousness was still there. In other words, for lack of a better term, the soul, or he, was still present. What else does that show? Everything that was said around him for the last 18 years, he heard. And we've had other studies like this of people who have been presumed to be brain dead, and they're lying there going, because they can't communicate at all, they're lying there going, no, not brain dead, no, don't, don't pull it, still here. Okay? So, where does Harry go in? He goes into the pensive. The pensive or Dumbledore's thoughts, are they edited or filtered? Their thoughts Dumbledore takes off his mind and puts in the thing so that he can stir and look at them later. For what? To understand them. Okay? Tom Riddle's diary, however, is entirely a production. With Tom Riddle as the editor. What, what does he write the diary for? To open the chamber? To frame Hagrid? Okay. Is Dumbledore trying to frame anybody here? Is Dumbledore trying to entrap anybody here? No. These are thoughts he's taken off wise because he has other things to deal with. So what does Harry see? He sees Dumbledore. He sees this room. He sees people brought in. Karkaroff gets brought in first. And what happens to him? <coughs> Chained to the chair. And there's Barty Crouch. Doesn't look quite the same as he does now. There's Moody. More of his nose is present. He's not as battle, uh, battle scarred as he currently looks. So, Karkaroff is called, labeled a death eater. And what does he do to get out? He doesn't get out, by the way. He gets sent back to Azkaban. He's a snitch. <laughs> he starts rattling off names. Page 589. Antonin Dolohoff, which we find out Dolohoff is currently where? In Azkaban. Next book, he breaks out. Okay? Crouch, we've already got him. In other words, we need more names. That one's no good. Uh, others? Rosier. Evan Rosier. Crouch. <coughs> Rosier's dead. That one's not going to help you. Come on. Fess up. Karkroff, a real note of panic in his voice now. Uh, more, Crouch says? Yes, Travers. He helped murder the McKinnons. <laughs> McKinnons are a couple we're going to see in a photograph in the next book. Mulsimer, he specialized in the Imperius Curse, forced countless people to do horrific things. Rookwood, a spy, passed he, must, he who must not be named useful information from inside the ministry. This time, Harry notices Karkaroff struck gold. Rookwood? Augustus Rookwood? Of the Department of Mysteries? The very same. He used a network of well-placed wizards, both inside the ministry and out, to collect information. Crouch, yeah, but Travers and Mulsimer we have. Okay, Karkaroff, that's all you have. No, I've got more! Snape! You knew it was coming, right? First time you read this, you knew Snape's name had to come. Dumbledore says, Severus Snape was indeed a Death Eater. However, he rejoined our side before Lord Voldemort's downfall and turned spy for us. Why is it important that he turned spy before Voldemort fell? There was risk. Huge risk. After Voldemort fell, you didn't have to worry about Voldemort. Okay? Who turned after Voldemort fell? 
The Malfoy said, wasn't us. It was the Imperius curse. The devil made me do it, kind of a reply. So, Carcroft gets taken off. Harry notices, halfway up the other benches, there's Rita Skeeter. Short, blonde hair, magenta robe, sucking the end of an acid green quill. And Ludo Bagman is brought in. Not the Ludo Bagman gone to seed. That is, not the Ludo Bagman Harry knows. Kind of paunchy face, very paunchy belly. Okay? This is Ludo Bagman what? In his prime, man. This is a stud. Okay. And he says, Crouch says, we have heard evidence against you and are about to reach our verdict. Do you have anything to add to your testimony before we pronounce judgment? Harry, Ludo Bagman, a death eater? Well, I know I've been a bit of an idiot. One or two wizards smile. Moody says, you never spoke a true word, boy. If I didn't know he'd always been dim, I'd have thought some of those bludgers had permanently affected his brain. Crouch goes on. You were caught passing information to Lord Voldemort's supporters. You ought to go to Azkaban. Bagman, but I told you I had no idea. Old Rookwood was a friend of my dad's. Never crossed my mind he was in with you-know-who. I thought I was collecting information for our side. Rookwood kept talking about me getting a job in the ministry later on. Once my Quidditch days were over. I mean, I can't keep getting hit by bludgers for the rest of my life, can I? What is Ludo Bagman? Plays for, um, Plays for the English team or the whatever team. He's a dumb jock. That's what he is. He's not a smart jock. He's a dumb jock, right? What does he say his crime was? I gave some information to a friend of my dad's. Why? He said he'd get me a job in the ministry. In other words, connections. Networking. Crouch says, okay, we have to have a vote. Please raise your hands. Those in favor of imprisonment, nobody raises their hands. Why not? Well, the one witch kind of sums it all up. We'd just like to congratulate Mr. Bagman on his splendid performance for England in the Quidditch match against Turkey last Saturday. Why? Because he helped him win a Quidditch match. Was Ludo Bagman a Death Eater? No, not really. He's just a moron. Okay? So, Ludo Bagman goes out. He's released. And then we have four people brought in. Flanked by six Dementors. They put them down in the chairs. The chains come up. And we see these people. A thick-set man who stares blankly up at Crouch. A thinner, a more nervous-looking man whose eyes were darting around the crowd. A woman with thick, shining dark hair, heavily hooded eyes. Sitting in the chair as it were a throne. And a boy in his late teens who starts crying out, Daddy, Daddy, Father, Father, you know. And what do we hear? You were caught and have been accused of capturing an or Frank Longbottom, subjecting him to the Cruciatus curse believing him to have knowledge of the present whereabouts of your exiled master, he who must not be named. Notice, Barty Crouch doesn't use Voldemort's name. Barty Crouch Sr. Who did? We heard Dumbledore use his name. We heard Moody use his name. I mean, in this trial scene. We heard Moody use his name. Right? Sirius has. He says, you're further accused of using the Cruciatus curse on Frank Longbottom's wife when he would not give you information. Mother, mother, you know. So what happens? They get sent off. They get accused. Right? They get um, convicted. So Dumbledore taps Harry on the shoulder. Come on, Harry, let's go back. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Dumbledore, it's okay, I understand. Harry asks what this thing is. Dumbledore explains it's offensive, why he uses it, how he uses it. Dumbledore says, yes, let me explain. Puts his wand to his mind, pulls some wispy stuff off, puts it in the thing, and what happens? There's Snape saying, it's coming back. Karkaroff, too, stronger and clearer than ever. Harry apologizes for looking in. Dumbledore says, no, it's okay, Harry. Curiosity is not a sin. 
that we should exercise caution with our curiosity. Why? Notice he doesn't tell Harry, you were wrong for doing this. What does he mean by caution? What did Harry think when he quote unquote read Tom Riddle's diary? It was all true. It was all true. Right? Dumbledore wants Harry to weigh evidence. He wants him to, to sift evidence. Okay? There's Bertha Jorkins. She pops up. And he tells Harry, where was Bertha Jorkins when she disappeared? Where Voldemort was last known to be? Albania. So, Harry asks, bottom of 600, you know why my scar is hurting me? Dumbledore says, I think it's that your scar hurts you when Voldemort is near you and when he's feeling a particularly strong surge of hatred. Harry, why? Because you're connected by that scar, Harry. So you, you think that dream that I had about Wormtail really happened? Yeah, probably. Did you see Voldemort? No, says Harry, just the back of his chair. But, I mean, there wouldn't have been anything to see, would there? I mean, he hasn't got a body, has he? Dumbledore, hmm, how indeed. If he hasn't got a body, how did Voldemort kill Frank Bryce? Because it was a high gun voice that said, I'm on a cadaver. And then Frank Bryce dies. Harry, you think he's getting stronger? Dumbledore, don't know, Harry. Give you my suspicions. Here they are. When he was ascending to power, what was happening? People were disappearing. And now what's happened? Bertha Jorkins has disappeared. Barty Crouch Sr. has disappeared. And somebody else has disappeared, but the Ministry of Magic doesn't think anything about this person. Why? Because he's just a muggle. Frank Bryce. And where did Frank Bryce disappear from? Voldemort's home. Okay? Or hometown. Harry doesn't know that part yet. Okay? So Harry asks, um, Crouch's son, were they talking about Neville's parents? Has Neville never told you why he's been brought up by his grandmother? Yes, they were talking about his parents. He says they're insane. Neville visits them during the holidays. They do not recognize him. That's not true. We will see in book five. Neville's mother does recognize Harry. Uh, excuse me, does recognize Neville. They visit Neville when? Excuse me, they visit Neville's parents when? Accidentally. Christmas on the closed ward in the Order of the Phoenix. Neville's mother gives Neville something. Okay? On Christmas Day, it is a Christmas present. It's a piece of trash, but it's a Christmas present. She does recognize him a little bit. Okay? So, Harry has a couple other questions. Uh, Mr. Bagman has never been accused of any dark activity since. Harry, okay. And um, no more is Professor Snape, Harry. What made you think he really stopped supporting Voldemort? That's a matter between Professor Snape and myself. In other words, curiosity, cautious, exercise caution, know where you should stop. So the third task comes. And they go in, and I'm going to skip a bunch. And we see Cedric put under the Imperious Curse. We see riddles that have to be done. Finally, Harry get in, and Cedric get past the um, Sphinx thingy. They disarm the spider. Page 632. The spider's got Harry. Harry raises his arm, expelling Armus. Okay, now where is Harry in relation to the spider and the ground? The spider has him way up in the air. How high? 12 feet, we're told. And he does expelling Armus so that the spider lets him go. So now he falls 12 feet. Well, he's already been bitten in the leg. So his leg hurts. 
He's not falling 12 feet like you can hang from the eaves of a house that has a 12-foot roof line. Hang, put your arms up there so that your feet are now seven feet, six feet above the ground. That's an easy drop. No, he's dropping two feet higher than this ceiling to the ground on an already hurt leg. Cedric, you all right? No, Terry yells, breathing freely. Cedric was standing, this is bottom of 632, Cedric was standing feet from the Triwizard Cup, gleaming behind it like there's spotlights on it. Terry, take it. Go on, take it. You're there. But Cedric didn't move. He merely stood there. He looks at Harry, and then he looks at the cup. And then he looks at Harry, and the longing on Harry's face. Take it. You should win, says Cedric. That's twice you've saved my neck in here. Harry, it's not how it's supposed to work. You got there first. Take it. No. Stop being noble. What does Harry mean? Does he mean, Cedric, you're putting on an act of being noble? No, he means stop being who you are, right? Take it, then we can get out of here. Cedric watches Harry, steadying himself, holding tight to the ledge because he's only got one good leg. You told me about the dragons. I would have gone down in the first task. I had help on that too. You helped me with the egg. Cedric, I had help on the egg in the first place too. That is, somebody told me about the egg. Harry, we're still square. He'd sprained his ankle when the spider dropped him. Cedric, you should have gotten more points on the second test. You stayed behind to get all the hostages. I should have done that. Harry, I was just stupid. Okay? Take it. No. He stepped over the spider's tangled legs to join Harry who stared at him. Cedric was serious. He was walking away from the sword of glory Hufflepuff had, house hadn't had in centuries. Why? Because Hufflepuff are what? Just, loyal, true, fair, and hard workers. Okay? Is he being just? Yes. Is he being loyal? Yes. Not to Hufflepuff house, though. He's being loyal to Harry. Why? Without Harry's help, he never would have gotten there for him. Is he being true? Yes. Fair? Yes. Hard worker? What has he just admitted? I didn't know about the egg until I was told. In other words, even that Cedric first said help on. All right? Go on, Cedric says. And Harry thinks, he sees himself walking out of the maze holding the cup. He sees Cho's face shining with admiration. And he found himself staring at Cedric's shadowy, stubborn face. Both of us. Let's both do it. Why? Hogwarts still gets the glory. We each, you know, win. 500 gallons for you, 500 gallons for me. Cool. They touch the cup, same time. Boom. It's a port key. And they're in a graveyard. Cedric, anybody tell you it was a port key? No. Nope. Part of the task, Harry asks. Cedric, don't know. Wands out, do you reckon? Uh, yeah. Notice, Harry's glad that Cedric makes the suggestion for wands out. Why? Because Harry doesn't want to look like he's afraid. But, I mean, they're in a cemetery. <laughs> Not a good sign. Someone's coming. So, this person comes, and where are they standing? So there's this big headstone, Rip, Tom, Riddle. Where are Harry and Cedric in relation to this headstone? About six feet away. Six feet. Here's Harry, here's his scar, and here's Cedric. They're both six feet away. The other person's coming from over here. The other person comes and stands beside the towering marble headstone. Standing here, carrying the little baby thing, whatever it is, in his arms. And Harry's scar bursts 
and we hear, we hear, kill the spare. A swishing noise, a second voice which screeched the words to the night, Avada Kedavra. A blast of green light, blast through, blaze through Harry's eyelids. He hears something heavy fall to the ground beside him. His scar, so painful he throws up. He opens his eyes, and there's Cedric lying on the ground beside him, now dead. Okay, he's dead. He's still what? Six feet from the headstone. Why? Because he fell to the ground beside Harry. What didn't happen to Cedric? He doesn't get hit with it and blast him. Right? Cedric was lying, spread eagled, on the ground beside him. So now, this person takes Harry, drags him over the headstone, so Harry now gets, you know, tied to this. Where is Cedric still? Six feet away from the headstone because he hasn't moved. Why hasn't he moved? He's still dead. Exact middle of page 639. Cedric's body was lying some 20 feet away. Harry's here. Cedric was here. And now he's moved. Where'd the other 14 feet come from? That's an example of bad writing. That's an example of worse copy editing. Okay, copy editor is supposed to go through your manuscript, your typescript, and find all the little inconsistencies like that. That is not a little inconsistency when it comes within a page where you have that kind of discrepancy. There's no way she can explain this away. She can't say, oh, well, when he got the Avada Kedavra curse, he was blasted away because falling down beside Harry is not 14 feet away. You don't say something is beside something if it's 14 feet away. Okay? It's got to be close. Anyways, so what happens? Wormtail sets up the nice little cauldron. He drops the baby-like thing in it. Harry, please, let it drown. Please, if there is a God, if there's anything in the universe that hears my voice, let it drown. And then what does he do? Bone of the Father, unknowingly given, you will renew your son. And this white dust comes out of the ground, of the grave, and goes into the cauldron. Flesh of the servant will be willingly given, you will revive your master. He whips out a knife, cuts to his wrist. Notice, that is not an easy thing to do. There are bones there that you also then have to cut through tendons and ligaments. Okay? Cuts through his wrist. One of my students this morning said, why does he cut his hand off? Why not like, you know, just a finger? I mean, it's still blood. It's still flesh of the servant willingly given. Why not, you know, just a little snip? <laughs> just, I guess it's Voldemort's requirement. And then you have the blood of the enemy forcibly taken. You will resurrect your foe. And he dumps that in, and Harry's sitting there thinking it's gone wrong, it's drowned, please, please, let it be dead, let it have gone wrong. And Joseph Fiennes walks out of the, you know, Ray Fiennes, excuse me, walks out of the uh, thing. So, 6.45, Voldemort says, hold out your arm. Your other arm, Wormtail, when Wormtail holds out this one, you know, with psh, 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 every beat of a heart, blood splurting out. He touches the dark mark on Wormtail's arm to do what? Summon the Death Eaters. And they all start appearing. So he speaks to him. He says, I smell guilt among you. And Avery comes forth and says, it's me, I'm sorry. A disappointment, bzz, he gets zapped. <coughs> right? So he looks at Wormtail, who continues to sob, page 649. He says, you return to me not out of loyalty, but out of fear of your old friend. You deserve this pain, Wormtail. You know that, don't you? Yes, Master, yes, Master, please, please. 
but you help me return to my body, so I'm going to reward you. And he gets a nice little silver hand. All right? So we have him, him, Voldemort, start naming the Death Eaters for us. Lucius, my slippery friend. I'm told you have not renounced the old ways. You were still ready to take the lead in a spot of muggle torture, but you never tried to find me. He said, I was constantly on the alert, and yet you ran from my mark. Well, uh, you know, you are merciful. Thank you. What does that tell us about Lucius Malfoy? What is one of Ron's favorite words or phrases about Draco Malfoy? Slimy git. In other words, he talks his way out of situations. Okay? So he says, here's some people that should, there are some people who should be here, the Lestranges, but they're in Azkaban. They'll get out soon. McNair, where we have seen McNair before? Uh, just the executioner. executioner for the Committee for the Disposal of Magical Creatures. Okay? He's there. Here we have Crab and you, Goyle, okay. parents of Crab and Goyle. Yes, Master, yes, you know, not. And then he says, and here we have six missing death eaters, three dead in my service. We've already heard them named in the trial. Okay. One too cowardly to return. Who's that? Karkaroff. And one who I believe has left me, for, left me forever. He'll be killed. Snape. So, he does what every villain in every classic bad guy film does once he has the good guy bound and ready to kill. What's he do? Fills the names. Monologues. Monologues. He sits there and he, you know, outlines his whole evil plan. Why? Because we need to know. <laughs> That's why we need to know for future reference, for future stories. So I'm going to skip all of that. And we get to the end of that chapter, and he tells Wormtail, give Harry Potter his wand back. And we get Priori and Contel. He says, Harry, you've been taught to duel, so let's, let's, let's have a duel. Well, where has Harry been taught to duel? Uh, By whom? Lockhart. How good a duel teacher was Lockhart? As with everything else, you know. Yeah, the worst. So he says to Harry, we bow to each other, Harry. Notice Harry doesn't want to bow. Page 660. Come on, niceties must be observed. Dumbledore would like you to show manners, Harry. He's right, Dumbledore would. So Harry doesn't bow. He's like, I'm not bow to you, snake face. So we bow, Harry. And Harry bows when Voldemort raises his wand. Harry feels his spine curve as though a huge invisible hand were bending him. Very good. And now you face me like a man, straight back, proud, the way your father died. And now we do a, you know, crucios him. And Harry doesn't like that. And Voldemort says, 661. That hurt, didn't it, Harry? You don't want me to do that again, do you? What's he doing? Cat, mouse. <laughs> you ever watch a cat after it catches a mouse? Plays with it a bit, then lets it go. And the mouse scurries, and the cat pounces again. Bats it around a little bit, lets it go. Cat's having fun. Why? Cats are sadistic little creatures. <laughs> I asked you whether you want me to do that again. Answer me. Imperio. Well, unfortunately, let's spill the beans here, his faithful servant's done too good a job of teaching Harry how to put off the Imperius curse. And Harry says, I won't. You won't? 662. You won't say no? Harry, obedience is a virtue I need to teach you before you die. Perhaps another little bit of pain. Harry's thinking, hell no. What does he do? Dives behind the marble headstone. Voldemort, we're not playing hide and seek, Harry. You cannot hide from me. Does this mean you're tired of our duel? Come on out then, Harry. Come out and play. It will be quick. It might even be painless. I would not know. I've never died. And Harry's lying behind the headstone, and thinking, there's no help. No help to be had. So he just comes out and waves the white flag and said, that's it, I give, go ahead and kill me now. No. Notice, 
He was not going to die crouching here like a child playing hide and seek. He was not going to die kneeling at Voldemort's feet. He was going to die upright like his father. He was going to die trying to defend himself, even if no defense was possible. This passage is linked to a passage in the sixth book, where Harry finally comes to understand what, Vol what Dumbledore tells him at the end of book five about the whole meaning of the prophecy and everything. He has to go through most of book six, still not fully understanding it. So just kind of store this away in your mind so that when we get to book six, it'll be there. So Harry jumps out. Voldemort uses a vada kedavra. He's not playing games anymore. And Harry uses what? Expelling armors. Why does Harry only want to disarm Voldemort? Why doesn't he try impedimenta? Why doesn't he try a stunning charm? Why doesn't he try any of a dozen other charms he could use? Why disarm him? Is it not like Voldemort could go uh, Oxio wand <laughs> and get his wand back? Kind of like a similar thing. Okay. Symbol who's defeat? Harry's or Voldemort's? Okay. There's a branch of martial arts, Aikido? I think it's Aikido, where what you do is you use your opponent's strength against him to do what? To disarm your opponent. For what purpose? So that your opponent doesn't harm him or herself. In other words, you're protecting your opponent. How is Harry protecting Voldemort here? What happens if Voldemort kills Harry? We learn all that later. Harry doesn't know any of that at this point. But what is Harry always doing with his quote-unquote enemies? He's protecting them. He can't help himself. Okay? So, expelling armors, Avada Kedavra. The two spells meet, and what happens? Gold and light. The big beads of light. And the beads are coming closer and closer to Harry, and Harry's thinking, I don't really think so. And the golden web over them, and the sound of Phoenix song, which for Harry means what? Next page. Hope. Hope. It's like hope fills him. What does the Phoenix song do for Voldemort? It's the opposite of hope. What's the opposite of hope? Despair. Despair. Despair means out of, lack of, away from hope. Okay? And it's as if he hears Dumbledore's voice say, don't break the connection. And what happens? Harry forces those balls of light to go back towards Voldemort's wand until it touches. What does that tell us? He's stronger than Voldemort. Right? And what happens? The wand starts to scream. Voldemort's eyes get really big. And a hand plops out. Okay, that's weird. <laughs> I mean, everything that's going on is weird, but that would kind of be, it would kind of make me, if I had my wand on Voldemort, he's my right hand, if I had my wand on Voldemort and I saw a wand, the hand pop out, I'd probably go like that. That would break the connection, right? So what happens? Hand pops out. We're not told, does the hand pop out just lie on the ground? Or is it like, you know, a thing from the Adams family and it starts to... <laughs> then what? Head, chest, arms. <coughs> Cedric pops out. Hold on, Harry. The shade of Cedric says. Then what happens? Somebody else pops out. Who's the next one? Frank Bryce. He was a real wizard then. Killed me that one, did? You fight him, boy. Then another body pops out. Bertha Jorkins. How does Harry know it's Bertha Jorkins? Because he saw her in the pensive. Don't let go now. Don't let him get you, Harry. Don't let go. How does Bertha Jorkins know this is Harry? Is he like this? Holding his hair up so that it doesn't hide 
his scar because his hair is normally down over his forehead. He has to do this in order for people to know who he is. How does she know it's Harry? Then his mother pops out. Your father's coming. Hold on for your father. It will be all right. Right? That's what mothers always say. If it's a two-parent family, it's okay. Your father will be here. What? He's going to make it all right. Really? Is James really going to make it all right? Is he going to come in and go, it's okay, Harry. I'll take over now. I'll take on this dirty, rotten bastard. You know. No. James comes out. Now, in an early, very early printing of this book, she had those reversed. James came out and then Lily realized the mistake, corrected it, and if you had one of those early, early ones, those are pretty rare and expensive now. I mean, they're like they're worth well over a thousand dollars. Okay. James comes out when the connection is broken. We'll linger for only moments, but we'll give you time. You must get to the port key. It will return you to Hogwarts. How the hell does James know about the port key? How does he know about returning you to Hogwarts? How does he know about they're in the Triwizard Tournament? Have he and, you know, Cedric been sipping tea inside Voldemort's wand? So how does he know? Spirit wisdom. Spirit wisdom. Yeah, but are these shades? What does, this is, I think, an important question. What does Dumbledore call these things? Echoes. In a couple chapters. Echoes. They are mere echoes, he says. Okay. I think he's wrong. They're not echoes. What are they? Or maybe they are echoes, but they're echoes of what? No. Spirit world, the beyond. Whatever. Spirit wisdom world, yeah, the great beyond. Souls. Okay. Where have we seen something kind of like this already? The mirror of Erised. Harry looks into the mirror of Erised, he sees himself surrounded by his family. Initially, when he sees himself surrounded by his family, his family's all waving and smiling. He does this because he tries to reach them, and what happens? His mother is still waving and smiling, but now she's crying. Why? Because now she knows, he knows she's there. And because she starts crying, James, standing next to her, puts his arm around her. In Harry's heart's desire... Uh-uh, folks. There's no way. The mirror is a mirror to something else. It is looking into something else. What's something else? For the well-organized mind, Harry, death is but the next great adventure. It's the beyond, okay? Which is going to be brought up in the next book when they go to the Department of Mysteries and they go into the death room. And Harry's like, hello, Who's here? Luna's like, I heard that. And they're looking at Luna like, yeah, but you're crazy. <laughs> okay. Notice in that scene in Order of the Phoenix, who wants to leave that room more than anybody else? Anybody know? Hermione. Why? Because that's not, yeah, that's not rational. You can't rationally understand the state of quote-unquote souls after death. It's obviously not something you can do what? You can't go to the library and get a book about it. Why? Not too many have come back and written books. And yet, Hogwarts is full of what? Ghosts. You've got the Bloody Baron. You've got the Fat Friar. You've got Nearly Headless Nick. We're going to see Ruin a Ravenclaw later on and others. So I think what we're seeing here is these are the souls of these people who are what? Aware of what's going on right now. There's no other way to explain how James knows there's a poor kid. Yes? I just have a question about the mirror since the philosopher's stone was put in the mirror. How that actually... How Dumbledore put it in? Yeah. That I have no idea. Uh, magic. Because <laughs> yeah. he's Dumbledore, you know. Plot device. It's because she doesn't. Answer, I mean, she does She never addresses that. Right. Dumbledore just says, you know, this is one of my, my one of my brillianter 
ideas or more brilliant ideas that only someone who wanted to take the stone and keep it safe would be able to get it out of the mirror. But yeah, we're never told how he puts the stone into the mirror. Unless he stands in front of the mirror with the stone and his heart's deepest desire at the point, at that point, is that the stone become part of the mirror. Other than that, I have no idea. It's a good question, though. All right? So, what happens before Harry does oxyoporky? Somebody else speaks to him after James does. What does Cedric ask? It's a pretty big request. I mean, think about it. Harry's got Satan on the other end of the line here, and he's being told, uh, Harry, would you mind taking my body back? What if I were Harry? Here's what I'd say. Uh, Cedric, a little busy. <laughs> we'll come back for it. Okay? I have a general idea of where we are. I'll send somebody. But no. He jumps to Cedric's body. Oxio wouldn't happen if he's 20 feet away, by the way. Okay. And um, touches the port key. Okay. So he goes back and Moody is the first one to Harry, says, I'll take him to Dumbledore. So he and Harry are walking back to Moody's office. Harry's saying things about Voldemort. In 675, Moody says, he forgave them? The Death Eaters who went free, the ones who escaped Azkaban? Harry, what? I asked you whether he forgave the scum who never even went to look for him. Those treacherous cowards who wouldn't even brave Azkaban for him. The faithless, worthless bits of filth who were brave enough to cavort in masks at the Quidditch World Cup. Oh, I don't know. Who are those? How does he put it? Faithless, worthless bits of filth. Malfoy, Crab, Goyle. When I fired the dark mark into the sky. Harry, you fired. What are you talking about? I told you, Harry. I told you. If there's one thing I hate more than any other, it's a Death Eater who walked free. And Harry's going, no, no, can't be. You taught me to fight off the Imperius curse. Harry, it, it can't be you. Who put your name in the Goblet of Fire, 676, under the name of a different school? I did. Who frightened off every person I thought might try to hurt you or prevent you from winning the tournament? I did. Who nudged Agrid into showing you the dragons? I did. Who helped you see the only way you could beat the dragon? I did. Who told Cedric about the egg? I did. Who gave Neville the book about Mediterranean water plants that if you'd only read it, you'd have known about Gillibead? I did. And yet, <coughs> Neville didn't tell Harry anything. Why not? Louder? Okay. In the book, he doesn't. Why doesn't he? Because it's cheating. And Neville's honest. Okay? So he goes on. It hasn't been easy, Harry, guiding you through these tasks without arousing suspicion. I've had to use every ounce of cunning I possess so that my mind would not be detectable in your success. Dumbledore would have been suspicious if you had managed everything too easily. As long as you got into that maze, preferably with a decent head start, I knew I had a chance. I'm getting rid of the other champions and leaving your way clear. But I also had to contend with your stupidity. The second task. I knew you hadn't worked out the eggs clue, so I had to give you another hint. Harry, you did. Cedric gave me. Who told Cedric? I did. I trusted he'd pass the information. Why? Decent people are so easy to manipulate, Potter. Why did he know Cedric would tell Harry? Loyal to what? Because Harry told Cedric. Cedric would want to repay the favor. Notice what he says. Decent people are so easy to manipulate, Potter. Why? What do decent people think of other people? That they're also decent. That they're also above board. Undecent people, indecent people, foul people, rotten people, think what of other people? that they're also following around like me, okay? 
So he's got his wand pointing at Harry's heart. He says, you were so long in that lake part. Man, you're stupid. I mean, really. Harry stared at Moody, top of 678. He just didn't see how this could be. Dumbledore's friend, the Aurora. And Harry, while Moody is looking at him, Harry's looking beyond Moody at the faux glass. And there are shapes that are becoming sharper and sharper and sharper in that faux glass. The Dark Lord didn't manage to kill you, Potter, and he so wanted to. Imagine how he will reward me when he finds I've done it for him. I will be honored beyond all other Death Eaters. I will be his dearest, his closest supporter, closer than a son. He keeps talking. Harry, you're mad. You're just crazy. Mad, am I? Boom! The door gets blown open, and we see a Dumbledore we haven't seen before. This is Dumbledore uncloaked. <laughs> this is Dumbledore going all Gandalf the White, you know. The look upon Dumbledore's face, middle of 679, as he stared down at the unconscious form of Mad-Eye Moody, was more terrible than Harry could have ever imagined. No benign smile upon Dumbledore's face, no twinkle in the eyes behind the spectacles. No longer is Dumbledore like jolly old Saint Nick. There was cold fury in every line of the ancient face. A sense of power radiated from Dumbledore. Okay. McGonagall says, come along, Potter. Dumbledore, no. He says he needs to understand. Why? Top of 680. Understanding is the first step to acceptance. And only with acceptance can there be recovery. In other words, Harry needs to understand who did this to him. Because only if he understands can he recover. That is, move beyond. Harry, Moody, how can it have been Moody? Dumbledore, it's not Moody. You've never known Alistair Moody. Okay. He pulls out Moody's hip flask, sets keys on a ring, talks to McGonagall and Snape, tells Snape, go get some truth potion. I know you have it, and you threatened Harry with it, you know. He tells McGonagall, um, to do what? Go down to Hagrid's hut and get the big black dog in the pumpkin patch. Okay. And he opens up the trunk, all the levels, and there down 10 feet below is thin, starving, mad-eyed Moody. Polyjuice potion, says Dumbledore. And Harry's like, oh yeah, I remember that stuff. Okay. Snape comes in, sees Barty Crouch, as with McGonagall. And notice, Dumbledore questions him right then and there. What doesn't he do, however? Get the camera. Roll the film. He doesn't record it. Well, but he does. Oh, what? Oh, um, the pin sieve. The Because what could Dumbledore, Snape, McGonagall, Harry do after this scene of Barty Crouch spilling the beans under truth sir? Go to a pensive, stir up. All right, everybody, watch. And there's a memory. Could that be used as proof in a wizarding court of law? We don't know. Yeah, does the wizarding court of law really impress with a lot of proof in it? Yeah, the Wisengamot does not seem to very uh, reliable when it comes to truth. Yes, you can tamper with memories. Very much so. Okay? So, it probably wouldn't be admissible because they could say it is, as we see happen in Half-Blood Memory, a made-up Half-Blood Prince, my Half-Blood Memory. You can see a made-up memory. But even in that case, in the case with um, New Defense Against uh, New Potions, um, Flughorn. I was going to say Leghorn. Foghorn, Leghorn. No. <laughs> With Slughorn, it's a memory he's modified. It's not a memory he's created. But in that book, we do see Voldemort has planted ideas in people's minds. So they take credit for things that they never did. Okay. So that's probably the reason why. So, Harry gets taken up to the hospital wing, and we get to chapter Parting of the Ways. 
He leaves McGonagall in charge of Barty Crouch Jr. And he goes up there, and, Harry, and Dumbledore tells Harry, page 694. Sorry, this is uh, Dumbledore's office, not hospital room. Sirius is up there now. Fox is up there. And Dumbledore says, Harry, I need to know what happened after you touched the poor key. Serious, come on, Dumbledore. We can left leave that till the morning. In other words, let the kid get some sleep. Dumbledore, no. If I thought it could help you by putting you into an enchanted sleep, allowing you to postpone the moment when you would have to think about what has happened tonight, I would do it. But I know better. Why? Numbing the pain for a while will make it worse when you finally feel it. Think of a physical injury. If you've ever had something like a broken bone, okay, and it has been temporarily taken care of. And then they have to really take care of it. Or, you know, like a real bad splinter or something. Like a quarter-inch nasty splinter. Well, you can numb that temporarily, but then you still have to do what? You still got to pull the damn thing out. That hurts like hell. Dumbledore is saying, guess what? Psychological trauma, like Harry has experienced, is the same way. Better to do what? Get it out rather than... Let it sit, because what happens when it sits? It festers. Why? Because you start to think about it. So, he says no. Serious? Harry's going to talk. So, Harry talks. He relates everything. He talks about what Voldemort said, about I had to use Harry's blood. Why? Because I will now have Harry's protection. And Harry says, and he did. He could touch me with no pain. And we get this passage where, for a fleeting instant, 696 at the top, Harry thought he saw a gleam of something like triumph in Dumbledore's eyes. Now, when this book first came out, there was a lot of discussion on the internet, discussion lists and things like that, where people suggested, oh, Dumbledore's really in cahoots with Voldemort. And that this is Dumbledore kind of going, yep, yep, he's right. This is his protection. What's Dumbledore thinking here? End of book seven. Let's get something good. I got him. Now, if everything else will fall into place. All right? So, Harry talks about what happens when the wands met. Priori and Quintanum. Serious. The reverse spell effect? Exactly. Page 697. Harry's wand and Voldemort's wand share cores. Phoenix feather. This phoenix, in fact. My wand's feather came from Fox? Yes. He says, Ollivander wrote and told me that. Okay, so what happens? Brother wands, Dumbledore says, will not act appropriately against each other. If, however, the owners of the wands force the wands to do battle, a very rare effect will take place. One of the wands will force the other to regurgitate spells it has performed in reverse. Okay. Serious. Diggory, back to life. Dumbledore. No spells can reawaken the dead. No, kind of a reverse echo. Yeah, but an echo always does what? 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 Uh, uh. It merely repeats. Okay? It's not what they were. I think this is an example of Rowling kind of giving us a little red herring. She, she wants to lead us a little bit astray by Dumbledore's words. She, I think she wants us to think there's more than what Dumbledore is actually saying. Dumbledore is going to say a lot in the next book. You know, I can be wrong. I, I can be wrong. So that when we get to book six and book seven, we hear and learn some things about Dumbledore, and we realize he has made mistakes. He has made big mistakes. All right? So Molly Weasley shows up. Um, and let's see here. Madame Pomfrey comes in. He wants Harry to drink it and help him sleep. Harry falls asleep. He wakes up later on. Loud noise outside, page 701. Fudge is yelling with McGonagall. So Dumbledore, excuse me, Fudge demands of Mrs. Weasley, where is Dumbledore? She says he's not here. This is the hospital wing, Minister. Don't you think you do? 
But Dumbledore comes in. Not quite like he was when he burst into Moody's office, but he's, he's, he's getting white, let's say. What has happened? Why are you disturbing these people? Minerva, I'm surprised at you. I asked you to stand guard over Barty Crouch. No need. Why not? Barty Crouch is no longer with us. Okay. Harry felt a chill in his stomach, page 703, as Professor McGonagall struggled to find words to describe what had happened. He did not need her to finish her sentence. He knew what the Dementor must have done. It had administered its fatal kiss to Barty Crouch. It had sucked his soul out through his mouth. He was worse than dead. Flood, fludge, fudge. By all accounts, he has no loss. Dumbledore, but now he can't give testimony. Fudge, testimony about what? Why he killed them, that's no mystery. He's a raving lunatic. From what Minerva and Severus have told me, he seems to have thought he was doing it all on you know whose instructions. Lord Voldemort was giving him instructions. Fudge is like, come on, preposterous. Come on, Dumbledore. Page 704. Dumbledore says, as they've told you, we heard Barty Crouch confess <coughs> under the influence of Veritasera. See here, Dumbledore, you can't seriously believe that. I mean, you know who back? I mean, come on, really, certainly. He might have believed himself. Notice that. Playing a psychological trick. He might have thought he was working for Voldemort. What's the problem with that? Harry, uh, I saw him. Oh, okay. So you believe Harry Potter? Dumbledore, top of 705. Certainly I believe him. You're prepared to believe Voldemort has returned? Notice Fudge uses the name. He's returned on the word of a lunatic murderer and a boy who, well, um, he doesn't finish the sentence. Harry kind of does. You've been reading Rita Skeeter. <laughs> and a boy who what? Has fainting spells in classrooms? who cries to sleep at night over his parents. Okay. You admit he's been having these pains and such? Dumbledore says, yeah, I believe his scar works him when Voldemort's near or feeling really angry. Fudge, 706. I've never heard of a cursed scar acting as an alarm bell. What should Dumbledore and Harry say at that point? Nobody's ever had one of these cursed scars. Harry, I saw Voldemort come back. I saw the Death Eaters. I can give you their names. Lucius Malfoy. Notice, Snape makes a sudden movement. But as Harry looked at him, Snape's eyes flew back to Fudge. Malfoy was clear. Very old family. Next phrase, donations to excellent causes. McNair, also clear. Now working for the ministry. There's your problem. <laughs> Avery, not crap, Goyle. You could have just gotten those names from newspaper accounts, he's essentially saying. All right. McGonagall, you fool. Cedric Diggory, Mr. Crouch. Not the work of a random, not the random work of a lunatic. Dumbledore. Voldemort has returned, 707. If you accept that fact straight away, Fudge, take the necessary measures. We may still be able to save the situation. How? Remove the Dementors from Azkaban. Why? Okay, one, they like it there. <laughs> Two, they're natural allies of Voldemort. Fudge, remove the Dementors. Half of us only feel safe in our beds at night because we know the Dementors are standing guard. Dumbledore. And the other half of us are what? Trump supporters. <laughs> Notice what's being said here. The wizarding world in England is what? Evenly divided. <laughs> half think this, half think that. The rest of us sleep less soundly in our beds, Cornelius, knowing that you have put Lord Voldemort's most dangerous supporters in the care of creatures who will join him the instant he asks them. In other words, how much control do you really have over them if Voldemort snaps his fingers? Fudge, opening and closing his mouth. He can't think of anything. Dumbledore, just he's on a roll, man. Send envoys to the giants. 
Giants, are you crazy? Extend to them the hand of friendship. Fudge, you can't be serious. Why? The end of my career. Ah, finally we get to it. He's thinking of what? His power. His power. Dumbledore, you are blinded by the love of the office you hold, Cornelius. You place too much importance, you always have done, on the so-called purity of blood. It goes back to the first book. Malfoy, Harry, Madame Malkin's Rose. You are the right kind, aren't you? You know, I don't think they should let the others in. Who are the others? Mudbloods, literally, but also unpure bloods or mixed bloods. You fail to recognize that not as met what someone is born, but what they grow to be. What was Hagrid born? Talk about half-blood, half-breed. And what has he grown to be? Okay, he's a gamekeeper and he's a teacher at Hogwarts. Not very bright, necessarily. But what else is he? Think of that Hufflepuff stuff. Honest, loyal, true, just, etc. Okay? What does Draco Malfoy grow to be? Book 7, the epilogue. A decent person. Lucius? Mm, not quite sure. What about Harry? Or what about Barty Crouch Jr.? Great old family. Goes way, way back, and yet he's a Death Eater. Your Dementor has just destroyed the last remaining member of a pure blood family as old as any. And see what that man chose to make of his life. It is our choices, Harry. Far more than our abilities that show what we truly are. Dumbledore tells Harry at the end of book two. Right? I tell you now, take the steps I've suggested and you'll be remembered. In office or out, it's one of the bravest and gravest, greatest ministers of magic. Fudge, you're insane. You're insane. Can't be. Who finally comes forward to give Fudge real evidence? Real evidence that Fudge can see and touch. Snape comes up and does this. Notice who he does that in front of. Harry, Sirius, Molly, McGonagall. They all see it. Did Sirius know he was a death eater before? Yes, he did. Did McGonagall know he's a death eater before? I think she did. Okay. Harry knew from the thing. Sirius. You know, as I said, probably. Snape says, but autumn of 709, there, the dark mark. Not as clear as it was an hour or so ago when it burned black, but you can still see it. Every Death Eater had the sign burned into him by the Dark Lord. It was a means of distinguishing one another. That is, they're each a little bit different. And his means of summoning us to him. When he touched the mark of any Death Eater, we were to disapparate and apparate instantly at his side. This mark has been growing clearer all year. Karkaroff's too. Notice he just said that in front of Harry, by the way. Why do you think Karkaroff fled tonight? We both felt the mark burn. We both knew he had returned. Karkaroff fears the Dark Lord's vengeance. He betrayed too many of his fellow Death Eaters to be sure of a welcome back into the fold. Fudge steps, steps back. I don't know what you and your staff are playing at Dumbledore, but I've heard enough. I have no more to add. I will be in touch with you tomorrow, Dumbledore, to discuss the running of this school. Now there's a threat. And he dumps a thousand gallons on Harry's bedside table. Here's your winnings. All right. So, 7-Eleven. Dumbledore, work to be done. Molly, can I count on you and Arthur? She said, no, of course you can. I need to send a message to Arthur. He says, we need to persuade... All those we can of the truth. Bill says, I'll go to dad. Okay? What else does he say? He says, McGonagall, I need to see Hagrid. I need to see Madame Maxime. Why? Giant work. <laughs> he says to Madame Pomfrey, go down to Moody's <clears throat> office. Okay? You'll find a house elf in distress. Help her. Okay? Serious? 
Can you take your usual form? That is not a dog. He turns into himself. Mrs. Weasley screams. Ron, shut up, Mom. <laughs> what is he doing here, says Snape. He's here at my invitation, as are you. In other words, I trust you both. If I trust you both, then what should they do? Trust each other. All right? So, Dumbledore tells Sirius what? I need you to set off at once. You are too alert. You are too alert. Remus Lupin, Arabella Fig, Mundungus Fletcher, the old crowd. Lie low at Lupin's for a while. Who's the old crowd? The Order of the Phoenix. Why are Molly and Arthur not included in the old crowd? Because they weren't in the Order of the Phoenix at the time. But notice who is named, who we've already heard named before. Arabella Fig. First book, when Harry gets to go off on Dudley's birthday party to the zoo. Why? Because the crazy old babysitter, Arabella Fig, tripped over one of her cats or something, has a broken leg. But we're not given her first name there. It's just crazy old Mrs. Fig. It's the same one. Right? And then he says to Snape, Severus, you know what I must ask you to do if you're ready, if you're prepared. I am. Then good luck. What must Snape do? Go back to Voldemort. Right? What did Voldemort say? I think he's left me forever. <laughs> He'll be killed. Right? So we get the last chapter, the beginning. What's at the beginning of? Why is it called the beginning? When it's the end. <laughs> it's the beginning of the... Okay, kind of the beginning of the end. It's the beginning of the second war, so to speak, against Voldemort and such. And so we have the... End of year feast... What usually happens at the end of your feast? Celebration. Celebration, awarding of the house cup and all that kind of stuff. And now, it's a funeral, <laughs> essentially. And Dumbledore stands up and says to all the students present, which notice are both Durmstrang and Bobaton, as well as Hogwarts, Cedric Diggory was murdered by Lord Voldemort. Panic spreads through the hall. Why? One, because they've been told Cedric Diggory is murdered. And two, he said the name. Right? And then what does he do that automatically is going to get every ear in that hall listening very carefully? No. Close. The Ministry of Magic doesn't want you to know this. The government wants this kept a secret. What's this? <laughs> but he says, I believe truth is generally perfect generally preferable to lies, and any attempt to pretend that Cedric died as a result of an accident or some sort of blunder of his own is an insult to his memory. So he explains what Harry did, essentially, and he tells them, bottom of 723, every guest in this hall will be welcome back here at any time, should they wish to come. I say to you all once again, in the light of Lord Voldemort's return, we are only as strong as we are united, as weak as we are divided. Lord Voldemort's gift for spreading discord and enmity is very great. We can fight it only by showing an equally strong bond of friendship and trust. Differences of habit and language are nothing at all if our aims are identical and our hearts are open. Notice, he doesn't say differences of language and habit are nothing. He's acknowledging there are these differences. But he says, they don't matter what? If we have a common goal. What should be the common goal of Hogwarts, Bobaton, Durmstrang? And by extension, what does that mean? All wizarding people, whether you're English or not, should be what? Against Voldemort. It's my belief, and never have I hoped so that I'm mistaken, that we're all facing dark and difficult times. Some of, the, some of you in this hall have suffered already, suffered directly at the hands of Lord Voldemort. He could go through and start naming people, right? Harry, Neville, 
And we're going to find people in the next book, other families that have already suffered, like um, student last name Bones. First name's either Amelia or Susan. Susan. The aunt is Amelia, who dies in the next book. Okay? But she's already had parents die. Because her parents were in the Order of the Phoenix. We're going to find out in the next book. So, Dumbledore says, Remember, Cedric, remember if the time should come when you have to make a choice between what is right and what is easy. Remember what happened to a boy who was good and kind and brave because he strayed across the path of Lord Voldemort. Well, what does that mean? Remember if you have to make a choice between what is right and what is easy. Think of Cedric, because he strayed a path across, straight across the path of Lord Voldemort. What does straight across the path of Lord Voldemort have to do with making a choice between what is right and what is easy? Did he have to stray across the path of Lord Voldemort? No, he didn't. Why did he? Why was he the sparer? He did what was right. He didn't do what was easy. What would have been easy? Fine! <laughs> Take the damn cup. And then he would have ended up in the little Angleton and Voldemort would have gone, damn, kill him anyways. <laughs> and then would have, you know, pss, Dark Mark Moody would have gotten Harry. Right, something like that. Okay? Remember Cedric Diggory. So, um, we find out at the very end about Ludo Bagman making the bet. Um, and the book ends, 733, with Malfoy, Crab, and Goyle coming in in one and two. Wanting what from Harry? Let's see here. Um, 729. You've picked the losing side, Potter. I warned you. I told you you ought to choose your company more carefully. Remember? When we met on the train, first day at Hogwarts, I told you not to go hanging around with riffraff like this. Too late now, Potter. They'll be the first to go. And now the Dark Lord's back. Mudbloods and muggle lovers first. Well, second, Diggory was the... Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle were all lying unconscious in the doorway. He, Ron, and Hermione were on their feet, all three of them having used a different hex. Nor were they the only ones to have done so. We thought we'd see what those three were up to, says Fred and George. George, who used the Fernunculus curse? Me, said Harry. George, hmm, I use jelly legs. Looks like those two shouldn't be mixed. He seems to have sprouted little tentacles all over his face. Right? So Harry, Fred, George, Ron, Hermione kind of all get their uh, jollies. Yeah, their good licks in on Crab, Malfoy, and Goyle. And yet what's going to happen in the next book when Harry gets on the train to go to Hogwarts? Draco gets him back. Draco gets him back. Okay? That's the beginning. Okay? The, the battle between Draco and Harry comes out in the open, so to speak. Okay, we'll stop there. So, for next week, as I said at the beginning, um...